Hello, Fukandi here, and welcome back to another episode of Planet Zoo. And I hope you enjoyed the little prairie dogs last time out. Like, I am so enjoying watching them scurry around this habitat here. They're just the most adorable little animals ever. Even though I think they're technically a rodent, are they? They're very cute. Anyway, playing with their little tennis ball, scurrying around, chasing each other. <laughs> it's adorable. But as you can see, they have got lots of babies. <laughs> got lots of babies which happened in the last episode along with the Nile monitors. So I want to start off today with a little bit of admin before we get into some more building and design ideas. So I'm actually just going to pause the game for a second <laughs> just in case anything else happens. But let's firstly talk a little bit about animal control and contraception. Now I'm giving away what animal we are going to be putting in later in this episode but let's just let's just filter this. Let's go to the Nile monitors because they were our original animal. In fact, let's go over there and just check on, see how they are all doing because there's an awful lot of them in here now. <laughs> so many babies, my goodness. Yeah, if we go to the zoo tab and into animals, we can filter by Nile monitors and then we can see all of the Nile monitors that we have here. I can also order them by maturity so you can see <laughs> we've got 13 babies. <laughs> it's unreal. But you'll see in terms of the breeding process it's working out because most of these babies are either bronze or silver so Nigel with his uh, silver appeal is doing very well at making very appealing babies <laughs> which will be good for us when we come to release them into the wild or rehome or trade out of the zoo because they are going to give us some more conservation credits than otherwise which is really great to see. However, we really want to control this because we do not want any more babies in here. This is far too many. They're already running out on space as well. If you remember in the last episode, if we click on them and go to terrain, you can see that it's a problem. They're in the orange. In terms of that overall welfare, it's okay. Like they're not doing too bad. If we go to social, you can see their space is down. Actually, it's still green. So it's really not of concern at the moment, but it is something to watch out for because any more of them and that will start getting into the red. So if we go into animals here, this is where we can apply contraceptives. So let's just filter by maturity. And what we're going to do is I'm going to put contraceptives. In fact, you know what? I'm going to put contraceptives on all of these. So if we tick this little box here, or of course you can go down and tick individual ones if you wanted to, but we'll tick this box and we're going to say all of you, including the babies having contraception, just in case, because I'm so slow on the detailing. If I'm detailing and they all grow up, I really don't want an influx of even more Nile monitors to deal with. So I'm just going to do this as a bit of protection. And once they grow up, we'll trade them out of the zoo and we'll start again, essentially. And I'll probably only put one of the ladies without contraceptives because we want to control how many we've got. This is massive overpopulation, which we really don't need. And exactly the same thing if we go to our black-tailed prairie dogs now already. <laughs> Kateri is pregnant again. <laughs> so... So we're going to have even more babies at the moment. We've only got five, so it's not too bad. It's not severe overpopulation. If we go to the Zoopedia, you can see they can have 12 of them. They can have 11 females. We can't have any more men, so that's a that's a slight problem. But we have only got two male babies, three female babies. So those three female babies could grow up and just live happily in with the rest of the pack here. But let's again for now put contraceptives on all of these and you can even put contraceptives on a pregnant animal which is super weird i mean they'll still remain pregnant and have the babies but that's fine how it is so yeah, that's how you control your animals within your zoo and realistically what i should have done when i first got these is put contraceptives on a couple of the ladies and just left one like the best one probably to breed with the male so that we could get the best babies out of it but you'll see we've actually got a gold rated baby and if you click on them as well, you can find out a little bit about them. If you go to stud book, you can see who their parents are. So this is actually Big Ounce and Bahamas, who is actually the highest rated. Even though she's bronze, she's got a higher rating appeal than the two Kateris, <laughs> Kateri and Kateri A. So that's why we've ended up with a gold baby. But anyway, that's a little fun thing to keep your eye on if you want to know your family tree of all your animals. But I think for now, let's just give them some names. So you guys have been coming up with some amazing suggestions. Absolutely love them all. Obviously we have Big Ants already after my favourite personal prairie dog. <laughs> but let's name the other ladies here. So first up we have Mary the Prairie from Josh B. Thank you so much for that suggestion. Absolutely love that name. And then we have Diglett. And that was a suggestion by Carlin Marcy Claire. Thank you so much for that suggestion. Absolutely love it again. 
And then the final one, I'm actually quite randomly going to call Ilos. <laughs> that was just a suggestion by Misa because she said I've essentially built Ilos in zoo form <laughs> with our prairie dog enclosure. So I love that. There's a gold square over there. I can see the likeness. Thank you for those suggestions. And then coming on to the babies, there's been so many good suggestions for this. The first ones I'd like to go for are Buster and Rex for the two boys. And that was a great suggestion that came through from Doodle Plays. Thank you so much for that. I really love those kind of generic, strong male names for these little tiny cutesy animals. Then we've also had, I think this is going to go on the girls' names, but we've had Snoop, which was suggested by a number of you, but I think Mackie was the first one in there with that suggestion. Thank you so much for that. And then we're going to have Scooby, which is a suggestion from the Witch Doctor. Thank you so much for that as well. And also Goofy, which was a suggestion from SK99. Thank you so much for all of your suggestions. We have managed to name all of the <laughs> prairie dogs. And I've still got more on my list that you guys came up with, which we'll be waiting for for when now Diglett has her babies. <laughs> And if we just skip back to the nine monitors as well, we've got a whole load of more names to put on this. So we did name our three adults, obviously, in the last episode, but let's go ahead and name a few more. Okay, so we have got Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth, <laughs> I can't even say it, Queen Elizabeth and Sergeant Slither Scales, and they were suggestions from ER. Thank you so much for those. We also have Iggy Eddard, that was a suggestion from Diaxis. Thank you. We've got King Tut, a suggestion from Johan Kruger. Thank you so much for that. And then we have also got D, which was from Brad Stanton, and Mona Lizard, which was from Dream. Thank you so much for those suggestions. And then the rest of them, I've just gone round and called them male names beginning with N. <laughs> but if you've got any other suggestions for other names, please do let me know. We'll obviously have more Nile Monitor babies and more Prairie Dog babies as well. So let me know your suggestions for those in the comments. So we're safe now to click play again. We're not going to be having any more babies other than Diglett's babies, which are due in due course. Now, there's a couple of other things I want to talk about before we get into the building today. And the first one is you'll see we've got a zoo alert here and you want to keep your eyes on these for sure. And this one says many guests think tickets are underpriced. And that's because we haven't changed our ticket price since we started our zoo. So it is just stuck on three dollars for adults and children. Now, with ticket prices, you can get away with charging the same for both of these, so I kind of recommend you do that, to be honest. But play around with them as you will. Completely up to you, obviously, how you want to do that. But you can't raise them up too much because people won't come to your zoo and you'll get a warning saying they think it's too expensive, so you need to keep your eye on that. But we've got two species in now and we've got babies of both of them, so I think we're safe to increase this quite a bit. So I'm actually going to put this up to... I'm going to double it up to $6 at least. And let's see if this goes away and see if people are happy with that, if they still think that that is underpriced. Because that really will help bring in a lot more money. If we go to our cash flow here, you can see income, ticket sales. It actually is not very much. So if we can double that, essentially, that'll be much better. And, and like I said before, it really is those donations, which are the key thing that bring people in. So the next thing I do want to mention briefly is this animal burrow because I didn't really talk about it in the last episode but this can act again as a shelter for certain animals so it is only for certain animals only there is a large burrow and a small burrow obviously the tiny little prairie dogs just need the small burrow that we can see here but you actually don't need a shelter like this if you have a burrow I just thought it'd be nice to add both which is why we do but what's really cool about this is it's all underground. So essentially the animals are sleeping in this little burrow underground and you can enter camera view. We've actually got an occupant at the moment. So let's go and have a look. And then you can look around in here. So yeah, as you can see, Scooby is sleeping in the little burrow. <laughs> it's very cute, but you can see them walking around in here and stuff like that. They usually just come in to sleep or to give birth and the such like. But the coolest thing to note actually about this animal burrow is that you can provide a video stream of that camera view for guests to look at. So how we do that is if we go into facilities and then into media devices and education and then visual media, we get various different types of screens here. Now, the ones that I really like to use for this are just the little TV screens, one meter. So they're really tiny and nice. And what I'm going to do is just put it on this wall, in fact, we'll align it to the surface of this TV screen. And then I'm going to hit X and we're just going to move it up. It is floated away from the wall there, the way the rock comes out. So we'll just drag it back in slightly so it doesn't look too <laughs> completely unnatural. You kind of cross create your own frames out of building pieces for all of these different screens. 
And that's something that I will probably do in the gift shop kind of entrance over here is create a whole load of screens of different animal burrows and different animal webcams as well, which is something we'll touch on in another episode too. So let's build this. We'll exit that. And then if we click on the screen, you can. there's a whole host of things that we could put on here. So you can create your own custom billboards and load them in. You can also include adverts for the various different brands around the zoo or some of the conservation information as well. There are videos here as well for the different brands. This is a gulpy video that we're seeing here. So you can create some really cool little billboards, actual video billboards for this. It's very cool indeed. So you can also come in here and choose the various different animal information screens, but please be warned that this does not provide education to your Sims. Only these big screens do. I think the coolest thing is here is if we go to the camera mod here, we can choose a particular animal burrow. So we're going to choose this one. And in fact, because we haven't named it, let's click OK. Let's go to our animal burrow here. And we're going to call it the Blacktail Prairie Dog. So if you've got a number of these as well, you can come in here and you can see which cameras are available. So we've got that. So now what is pretty cool is that all of these visitors walking around will be able to see in that burrow on this little screen. So I yeah really like how that works. OK, so coming on to the builds for today now, what I'm going to start off with is a food and drinks court over here. And then we are going to come onto a black and white roughed lemur enclosure around the side of our prairie dog habitat here. Again, remembering back to the plan that I showed you in the last episode, we are going to put in a big station and a gift shop in this area. So we're leaving this space quite clear. So the lemur habitat will be slightly further back. But I do want to come in and start dressing up this side of the entrance and particularly because we are yet to have a single food or drink shop actually in our zoo I think it's quite important we get this in now so let's get started okay so I'm going to start off this building with the stained wood panel pieces which come from the aquatic pack DLC and I'm going to just change the color of them a little bit and kind of want is a reasonably darkish wood color but the reason why I like this one is because each of the panels are very slightly different colours, so it's not really uniform like one of the other wood pieces that comes in the Planet Zoo game. So I think from that perspective, it has quite a nice little effect to it. And I'm just thinking I'm just going to turn this around, have a look at it from different angles, but I'm quite happy with that colour. So let's go for this. So what I'm going to do is start placing in the shop fronts and I actually want them to be two metres apart. So I'm going to kind of steer away from the traditional four meter grid for this just to show you a few different techniques of how you can make your building slightly more interesting. So where we've got this two meter gap now we can use the two meter panel in order to fill that in. So we just want to place that in nicely like that and then we can actually now that we've got it lined up we can use control x to duplicate that and then we'll just flip it to this other end over here and line it up nicely. And then what we want to do is go around and complete this with some back walls. Now you'll notice it is slightly thinner, but it doesn't make a difference when you're looking at it from the front. So that's why I like to use these little pieces here. We're actually going to make it too wide. Now the shops are four by four, but I'm going to make this an eight deep building because I feel like that just looks a little bit nicer. So we will go ahead and do that. And then I'm actually going to add a two meter wall to the top of these, potentially one meter. Yeah, we'll add a one meter wall to the top of these. So again, I'll snap into that side over there and we'll just follow that across. Now we can see that those panels are very slightly recessed. So let's hold shift and click both of them and then we'll just click X and that will move both of these in line. And then we can try and line it up a little bit nicer. It's sometimes a bit tricky. And that doesn't look too bad for me. We're actually going to cover this up with a bit of detailing anyway. Then on the front of this side of the building, you'll see this is completely incomplete, <laughs> but you'll see, you'll see why in a second. On the side of the building, I then want to go to uh, have a look at our pillars. Now I have done some more research with my mechanic, I would add, so we've got some new world pieces in here now. But what we're going to do is we're start, going to start snapping in these columns at the edges of all of these blocks. So you can see that's two panels. Again, this is why we I really like the wood pieces, because you can measure things nice and accurately got two panels away from that board so we'll snap them in like that and we'll do one at this end as well and then we will also do it here like that and then with these pillars we can then select these and because we've got the building slightly taller we'll do Control x and then we shall just shift them up like this so that they reach the rooftop where we'll put the edge of the roof 
just like that. And then we'll click OK here. Now we do need to fill this in a little bit here, but for now, this is going to be the basis of our building. So if we go to Exit Group, you'll see the whole group is selected. I mean, if you're away from that, you can, of course, click on any part of the building and you'll have the group there. So what I'm actually going to go is go to Duplicate. I'm going to make sure our angle snap is turned on really importantly. And I'm going to hold Z and I'm going to just snap it about 45 degrees this way. And then we're going to place this in like this. And now actually, before I do that, I've realised we don't need these pillars on the end. So let's go back into that group and we'll just delete out these two pillars. Exit the group and then we'll duplicate it again and try again. And then what we're going to do is try and line up those boards on this corner really nicely so that it forms a yeah a nice section of the building. And then what that's done is just copying that section is help to increase our efficiency because we're not having to draw this part of the building in twice, ultimately. And then we can come to edit here and we can just very click, easily click M on our keyboard and move these walls over. Now I'm going to snap to two meters because I know this is where the edge of the grid is going to be this side like that and then we can just again move all of our various different walls over slightly until it all fits in nicely here so let's hit this panel and then we'll do Control x to duplicate that and we'll just very easily slide this across until it's lined up correctly to the edge of the building there click ok and then we'll do exactly the same for our pillars and of course, we've got a slight gap that we do need to fix here. So let's just go into this group. I'm going to actually delete out this panel piece here. And then if we go duplicate that, and then I'm going to exit the group so we're a little bit more freeform. I'm then going to go into X control. So we've got a bit finer movement control on this. We're going to try and line this up to this panel edge here. And we'll use a two meter panel again to fill the gap. Okay, so slight edit. I did actually just change this top piece to a two meter because I've done one meter in error, <laughs> which doesn't match the design that I wanted to do for this building. So I have just changed that. Now let's come on to putting slopey roofs on this. So you do have these stained wood slopes. Let's just go back and get our wood color. There we go. So let's add this to the group. Now there are various different slopes for roofs. So you do have one meter slopes, two meter slopes and four meter slopes. Four meter slopes are very, very steep. Obviously two meter slightly less so and one meter quite shallow. Now for this, because I've got a two meter high wall here and eight meters actually across, what I am going to use, which is the most appropriate one for this, is this one meter sloped roof connection. Now you can see it's not snapping to the right height. So let's go to a two meter grid height, which then yeah, snap us nicely into the position it needs to be there. We'll just bring it down this side and then you can fill in this gap with a little one meter square like that and that gives you a really nice roof edge on the side so we'll want to go ahead and do the same over here so let's exit that group we'll just hover over here to add it to this group change the grid size to two meters as well and then we'll add in our roof support pieces now in terms of getting this roof on I'm going to actually just use this asphalt one meter roof, which may be deemed a slightly odd choice because it's not the prettiest, but it's pretty basic. And I think that's all that we really need for this food and drinks area here. Now, what I think is nicest with these roofs is to have a bit of overhang. So you can do that if you use roof trims here. This will give you a nice little trim to the bottom of your roof so you can use that. But it doesn't help on a slopey side. There's obviously also corners as well. We were sloping it down the side. We do have a play around with these and of course we'll do some more designs as this series goes on but the way i am going to design this we're going to choose the one meter slope if you've used the two meter walls then you'll want to use the two meter one you'll see like that just doesn't marry up to the one meter slope so this is the one we want to go for here and i'm going to overlap it actually by two meters out the front because i want a kind of little shady bit out the front i think here so we're going to overlap it by that amount but you can see it snaps really nicely into where we've got the wall supports, which is our normal grid. But as soon as we start going over, the height snap is just not working here. So let's take grid height all the way down to zero, and then we get a lot more freedom in terms of the height of our roof. So you can see that is actually lining up perfectly here. So what I want to make sure is we're getting a slight overlap on the side, because I think it it leads to a nicer roof design and also on the front like that which may seem extreme but it's gonna work 
And then what we're going to do is just holding shift, keep lowering the roof as we go back down. So it's sticking out quite far on either side. And we can click all three of these pieces and just duplicate it and start moving it along our building here. So with the roof, the trickiest part with these two part buildings that aren't on nice right angles is joining it in the middle. So you can see here, once I've put them all in together again, using X and removing them from the group so that I can position them exactly where I want, we get this really, really janky, horrendous middle. But what we're going to do is actually cover that up with some great vines and some detailing, which is going to link from the front of the building all the way across to the back. So I think it should look quite nice in the end. And there are other ways that you can do this, like using wall panel pieces to act as roofing, again, which we will go over later on in the series. But I think for now, if we're starting out with sloped roofs and interesting building shape designs, this is probably the easiest thing to do. Make it look awful and then cover it up with some lovely natural detailing.
Okay, so there we go, and I've just hit play again, and our little food and drink stands are open. Now, just to remind you as well, in construction, of course, in signs, you can search for any of these. So, like, we've got a chief beef here, and you can come up with loads of chief beef signs if you want to. Obviously, a line to surface, make sure you're doing that, and then you can put these all in if you wanted to here. I'm kind of thinking I'm just going to keep it really nice and natural. I've kept the detailing pretty simple on this. Obviously, just got our grapevines that we had flowing over the roof to cover up the weird jankiness just coming down and underneath. And so it's sort of growing up over around that sign in the middle there and then in each of the pillars as well. So I'm kind of liking how that has turned out. But I think overall, it's kind of cute. Like when you come in the main entrance as well here, you sort of get that slight view over the bushes into the food and drinks area. Then you can come in and there's loads of people already using them, which is great to see. Now, of course, we've got loads more stuff now with the vendors which come with the shop. So you don't need to hire the vendors independently. Obviously, further down the line, when we have more and more shops in, we may want to get additional vendors to cover breaks when they're tired so that we, our shops aren't closed. Um, but we're going to talk about staff management and work zones. I mentioned it might be this episode, but there's so much to cover this time around that we're going to do that at the start of next episode. So watch out for that. That'll be a little bit about staff management and the such like. But for now, this is working fine. They will be able to use the staff room over here, so they'll be able to just come down this staff path by the entrance. So it's you know reasonably close to where they're working, which is ideally what you want to see for your staff. So we'll have lots of staff rooms placed around the park. There we go. So we've got like little picnic benches and people are using them. I've used the logs again in this central bit that we used around the pathways. This will be a common theme, I think, throughout the zoo. We'll keep this going in most places. And then lots of bushes, a few sunken trees at the back as well, just to give it a little bit more overgrown bushiness. But some of the bushes are a little bit neat, but I think overall it's working well. These guys seem to be enjoying their drinks at least. Having a good time. <laughs> Welcome to Fuzu. Be yeah, a key thing with food and drinks areas as well is make sure you've got tons of bins because people are going to want to use them so they won't really throw rubbish away until you've got these in your park obviously we've got vending machines so they need them already but really crucial to have them all around your food and drinks areas in particular you need them all over your park realistically because you'll see they'll walk around oh, and chuck their rubbish <laughs> a good like couple of meters great shot there <laughs> But definitely make sure you've got them surrounding your food and drinks areas and picnic tables obviously are useful for those who want to sit down and just take the weight off while they enjoy their oh birdies bakes very nice <laughs> so i have had my mechanic in the background as well doing a little bit of research so we did unlock one more food stall and one more drink stall here so that is why we've managed to put in four different ones so we've got a food and drink over here and a food and drink this side so lots of choice for people uh, and different places to queue as well but there we go so we've got our first little food and drinks stall in so let's move on and put in our next habitat okay so it may come as no surprise based on what you saw earlier but we are going to be putting in a black and white roughed lima habitat now the reason why i've left it playing i've been doing research in the background is so that we could get like a decent selection of these animals because when you go to animal trading in sandbox you only get four at a time you will have more unfranchised, but the pricing is going to vary massively depending on what people are selling them for. So do just watch out for it. OK, so we have a total of eight black and white rough lemurs. And if we go and just have a little look at them on the Zoopedia. So you can have up to 16 adults in a habitat. So we've got half of that. This is really going to give us a lot of babies and because these are also critically endangered they have really high appeal which is why i kind of chose them so look we're into the 2000s now versus the 1000s for our black tailed prairie dogs and of course the nile monitors as well so when we have babies and we release them out to the world we'll get a lot of conservation credits and also for trading them as well if you are playing on online franchise mode so if we just have a little look in here now they do have up to one to four offspring <laughs> that's going to be interesting but let's say we do have 16 adults in there and let's say 12 offspring worst case scenario what we're looking at is quite a small actual land requirement but they need a lot of climbing so this is what we're going to explore today is climbing we haven't done this yet for an animal um so we need to build climbing frames essentially for them so we'll be coming on to explain that but first let's build ourselves a habitat and so the important thing for this as well is this fencing requirement right here so we either need a grade one climb proof fence of more than 1.25 meters 
or we need water which is three meters wide and one meter deep now they will not be able to swim climb whatever through that so you could produce a water moat around your lemurs and that would keep them in so that information is right there and we are going to be coming on to a monkey island later on in the season so yeah don't worry we'll cover water barriers later on but for now we're going to focus on the climb proof fence so based on my zoo plan, my black and white rough lemurs are going to be going here because the ultimate plan for this zoo is we will be having a monkey area or a primate area, should I say correctly, right here. This route will be taking you into an Asian themed area and on round to South America and North America at the top of the map here, which is sort of surrounding this primate area that will sit there. The plan is we'll have a big long straight street that goes past a huge lake up here on into a big square which will have an education centre and a reptile house at the top and then over this side we're going to come on into an African area which will span all the way down here we'll have a massive African savanna which guests will be able to enter with a transport ride as well so super excited to come on to that and then sitting in the middle here we'll have a, a, a kind of aquatic area an underwater area <laughs> So we'll have big sl deep slopes in the terrain going down into a essentially kind of little tunnel walk which will flow through lots of underwater viewing platforms around different aquatic animals in this area. So a few different themes throughout our park and that's kind of how I've planned it out but this is going to be the start of the primate area here. So when we come into barriers you'll notice like some of these will say not climbable so we could just use this concrete barrier for example and have make sure it's more than 1.25 meters and then the monkeys will not be able to escape. The actual barrier that I'm going to use for this is this steel mesh barrier. Now it does say climbable, which is a problem, so it doesn't matter how tall we make it, the monkeys are going to be able to climb it and get out. However, that's not always the case, so there is an option where we can change this and add a climb proof bar. So this is the one I'm going to use, and you may notice a few more barrier options in here, and that is because I have had one of our mechanics, which we do need to give a name, Joan, she has been researching barriers a little bit, so we have got a few more options here. I still really need to get onto these two because we will be wanting those. Certainly when we come to the aquatic area, the thick glass will really be wanting at that point. But that's why we've got a few more options in here. And I'll just say, just keep on, keep on with your staff research. Really keep on top of it. It's so, so valuable. So my plan for this habitat is we're going to create a big steel mesh octagon here and then an indoor area which will run along here with glass walls so that people can look in and another little steel mesh kind of square area so not the octagon shape down this end for a little bit of a quieter space for the monkeys because this really will be surrounded by the main park so it'll be a big feature area I think for the lemur habitat. So let's just make sure that we're starting a decent width away from this so that we can get enough path space in and do a bit of detailing around it. Like, don't be tempted just to cram absolutely everything into your zoo. Do leave space around things so you've got a bit of breathing room. So I'm going to take a length of eight for this and I'm going to put the first piece like that. And then what we're going to do is snap to 45 degree angles to come all the way around in our octagon like this. And we'll just join it in. Now, of course, if we click on the barrier, we click this circle, we then get this height adjuster, and I'm going to pull this up to the maximum that it will go, which is 11 metres. It maybe feels a little bit extreme, but we're going to have a huge climbing frame for them in here, so I think this is going to be pretty cool. And it's going to be quite a dominating factor when you come down here. You're going to see this absolutely massive steel mesh area, cage essentially, for our lemurs. So now in order to make this not climbable, what we'll do is we'll select the whole barrier again. And if we go into settings within barrier here, that you'll notice there's this climb proof option. So what we do want to do is add this on. Now you need to make sure you're getting the right size. You see that is on the left hand side. If I did it right, that's they're still going to be able to climb over that. So you want to make sure it's kind of positioned inside the enclosure like that. You could have both sides if you wanted to. That's a dual barrier with monkeys or animals that can climb both sides. But this is what we want for this because there's going to be paths around here so we don't need a dual one and that stops the animals from climbing out of this barrier so super super useful to have that on so now the rest of the habitat is going to be formed of actually construction pieces forming the barriers for the rest of it the corridor we're going to have a staff area built into the back of it as well so i'm actually going to go ahead and do that in a time lapse with a little bit of commentary over the top Please feel free to let me know if you like this format in the comments or if you prefer just watching time lapses without the commentary and a bit of explanation afterwards. Let me know what you think. So obviously I did show you how to put the climb proof barrier element onto the top of the barriers there, but we're actually going to put a roof onto it, which would stop them from climbing out anyway. 
And we're just using the plain plaster pieces for this because there's lots of nice elements to it. So we'll use it for the whole build actually, for this whole habitat. Now getting this roof in was pretty tricky. Trying to line them up so that you get nice smooth right angle corners is yeah, not, not the easiest thing. So it was a little bit of trial and error here, but once I had one corner perfect, I then copied and pasted it across the roof and actually it was pretty simple from there. So it's just a little bit fiddly to line them up in the first place, but once you get there, it's it's not too bad. And yeah, you'll see I'm adjusting it multiple times. Now the roof wasn't perfectly symmetrical but I'm actually fine with that because anyone down at street level in the zoo is never going to notice that and it's only very slightly off so I left it. And then next we started building out the big corridor that would form the basis of the sort of indoor part of the habitat going on to the little outside meshed area down the other end and again just using plain plaster wall pieces for this because there's lots of intricate nice elements to it like there's a piece with a circle in the middle which you'll see us using in a second and then i just used the corrugated plastic roof And I built out this one segment of it because I wanted to check that the design was going to work before I then went ahead and built the rest of the building. So you'll see me uh, just building this one section with all the wall pieces in before I build it out into the long corridor. And now because in a second we will be deleting out that element of the mesh fence so that the lemurs can go into the octagon and then run down into the corridor. I needed to block off the part of the wall that was above the roof. And it was a little bit tricky because the corners kind of wanted to snap into the wall. So I had to remove them from the group ultimately and just place them in the wall so that we got nice right angled corners. I love these circular hole plaster wall pieces for habitats such as this because the monkeys can climb through it and it's really really cool to watch and you can put some climbable elements to help them get through it and into the other room which yeah I just I just love that element so I use them quite a lot in this build. And if you want to see these time lapse in a bit more detail, don't forget on YouTube, you can slow the pace down so you could watch it almost in real time. I've sped this up by 500%, so you'd want to go down to like 0.25 if you want to see it kind of accurately. And I just added this little staff area onto the back here. I did end up changing this and moving the keeper hut forward so that we could fit an electricity transmitter into the back of it because you can put those actually with a wall right over the connection for it and the mechanics can then still fix it and repair it from the outside of the wall. It's a pretty cool thing and I'll show you that at the end of the video. So the next thing was to come through and put in the barriers. Now I did try putting in a glass barrier originally over those three glass holes in the walls where I want where the corridor runs through because I thought I'd use the barrier element for it. This didn't actually work out very well because it's very difficult to get it lined up into the wall accurately when I've snapped everything into the grid. So I actually ended up swapping it out for some glass wall pieces later on. And the key thing with the null barriers is make sure they are outside your walls. Obviously you don't want the alarms going off thinking the lemurs have escaped when actually they haven't. So make sure that those barriers sit outside of your construction walls. If you snapped everything into a grid like I have here, then it should be pretty simple to do. And here we are putting in the glass wall pieces.
Now down this end, I'm just using some mesh pieces here to create a cage onto the end. And again, really the key thing here is snapping to angles, snap everything to angles all the time, and then it will really help speed up the build. So I'm having a full mesh roof with a slight angle to it just to create a little bit of interest and then coming down straight for the visitors to look in from the pathway on the outside. So I start off by putting in the mesh piece and then the wooden frame around it. Now you'll find out later in this episode this was a huge, huge oversight by myself. These wood pieces don't use them in a climbable animal's habitat. <laughs> we'll get to that. So I do end up changing these out for some metal beams. Now because everything is in blocks of four, what I have done here to make it much quicker is to create one little segment of it and then copy it down into the rest of the area. So I'm not having to put in multiple things multiple times. That really helps speed up the process. And then we just simply need to go in and put in the ends. And again, we can do this on one end and then copy it all the way down to the other end of the habitat. And that gives us a nice mesh barrier. And when you get some little smaller sections like you're gonna see in a second, there's lots of different sizes of this mesh barrier. So it's super diverse actually to use in your habitat. So you can get right down to just a half a meter squared to fill in those tiny little gaps in a triangle as you'll see me doing here. And then we want to come in and put the path in and this is probably honestly the trickiest part. Getting a path around an octagon is no mean feat. Now there is a function on paths to snap into barriers but it really doesn't help when you're going around a shape like that so it is just a lot of trial and error to get it right. And don't forget the Z function, don't forget control and of course don't forget to smooth off some of your corners afterwards. And finally you see here we're putting in the main path, the eight metre wide path that will lead them on into the further part of the zoo. But of course we are keeping that path very separate for the guests to view the lemurs on so that they're not blocking people as they flow through the zoo. And then the final element of course is adding education and donation boxes. Now with the education speakers it is very important that they do not overlap. So you'll see here in a second I have one speaker which shows up red when we look at the area of effect of it. We do not want that. Guests get really annoyed if they have overlapping speakers. So you want to avoid that at all costs. Okay, so we have got our habitat in and I have clicked pause now that we've got a couple of lemurs now arrived into the habitat. And I'm firstly just going to check that there is absolutely no <laughs> escape points for these animals. So we just need to go and click on a lemur. Obviously go to our heat maps and check habitat. And now they have got an escape point, interestingly, on the roof. Because I don't understand where they are escaping from there. I don't think there is actually a point they can escape from here. But there is something over here that is bothering them. So let's just click on it again. I'm very confused as to where they think they are escaping from here. <laughs> There's literally no holes. So it may be a case that we have to see how it goes because I don't think they can get out of that. I mean, it does say that they can. No, we may have problems with this, but I'm going to be reluctant to believe it at the moment <laughs> until I start getting alarms and lemurs escaping all the time. We're going to go for it. We're going to go for it because I'm pretty convinced that that is actually OK. So, of course, the next thing we want to do is check their habitat requirements. So terrain wise, they like shorter grass and soil, actually. So we will be doing a lot of that in here. So that's keeping them happy for now, at least. So that should should be OK. And they like lots of plants, which is really great news. So we can fill a lot of this big octagon chamber here with a lot of plants, which will be really nice. And this other little outside bit as well. We should hopefully be able to fit a bit of a tree in the middle here, but we're going to have tons of climbing frames in here because the one thing with monkeys 
is of course they need climbing space. So I have in mechanic research, if we just go and take a look, done quite a bit of research on shelters and climbing because within this you can get some blueprints for climbing. So if we go to habitat, of course, we always want to filter on our species. So we'll go to the black and white roughed lemur and that gives us all of our items that we can use for them that are applicable for them. And when we come to the enrichment items and climbable, there's tons of really cool stuff we can use. These little bridges are amazing. As you'll see, when I've researched, there's lots of blueprints here. So if you can't really be bothered or, you know, it's not really how you play the game to build your own climbing frame, you can piece together a lot of these pieces. And don't forget, you can use shift as well to adjust them. There's some really cool little climbing frames like this one here. It's pretty big, so you can fill a lot of spaces with some of these. That one you don't want to pull up too much. These are probably the only blueprints really that I actually use in the game because it is useful sometimes just to get a quick little okay I want some log pieces together to connect to here and use some of these so that's what we'll be piecing together but essentially in terms of climbable items there is a lot of things that are climbable so let's go to nature and of course in here we'll come to our filters so it's just simply Africa and tropical for them but within here if we also actually then go to foliage type and go to trees there are some trees in here so if I just pick one of these this is probably not the best one <laughs> Let's try it anyway. Let's turn off a line to surface. We're going to go into the middle of the enclosure and we put it in here. Now, if I click play and let it run just for a second, then we'll go back to the heat map and check. Oh, God. <laughs> check escapable areas. Okay, so this is a tree that they cannot climb because you see when they're able to climb something, we'll go back in here, you can see these green lines so they are absolutely able to climb these poles which is why i think it's saying that they can escape from the roof even though there is meshing over there so that is what we really want to watch out for and it may be that actually we have to change some of these poles for metal ones because i don't think they can climb them in fact we can test that here as well we go to these architectural beams and we just put one in there let it play for a second yeah it will go away and it'll come back yeah see they can't climb those so i think what i will have to do here oops is change our wooden beams out for those metal ones, which I'll do in the next detail in time lapse. And hope in the meantime, one of them doesn't escape. Well, I'll show you what to do if they do escape. But there are certain trees that are climbable. This is what I really wanted to say. So let's come back in here. So the sausage tree is clearly not one of them. So let's just go ahead and delete that. And it's a little bit of trial and error until you get to know the trees that are climbable. So let's try this one. Again, if we go back to heat map and habitat, you see you can got a green line on this. So that means the monkeys can climb up this tree. Oh, hello. We we have got an escaped animal, I think. Have we? Yes. <laughs> There's one sat on the roof right there. And they don't mind because you can create walkthrough habitats for the black and white rough lemurs. So they're not actually going to run away scared. But what will happen is this lemur is going to run around your zoo and knock over bins and destroy stuff, basically, which is not really what you want. So there's two options really when an animal has escaped. Obviously, listen out for the alarm. And if it's a dangerous animal, you will see people running and fleeing. <laughs> no doubt about it. But for this one, it's not dangerous. So we can then just call the vet or we can do an emergency animal catcher. I mean, we've got loads of money, so let's just do that. And it will immediately be boxed and the vet will come to it and take it back to the habitat and put it back. Here we go. Here's the vet running away, <laughs> coming to get it and bring it back into the habitat. Now, if you've got an inspector in your zoo, you do not want them to see that you've got an escaped animal because it will mark negatively for your zoo. So you really don't want them to see that. So I'd recommend if you've got an inspector in to do the emergency capture, if you've got enough money to do that. Otherwise, yeah, you can just call the vet and they'll come and get them unless it's <laughs> unless it's a lion or something, in which case you probably want to do <laughs> emergency capture for risk of uh, scaring all of your guests out of the zoo. Okay, so I'm just going to hit pause there because we don't want any more of them escaping. So what I will do is definitely change those up for that metal beam that they can't climb. That was a massive oversight on my, on my half. I just thought the wood looked really nice. But yeah, going back to my original point, yes, they can climb some certain trees. So you can really use those to your advantage. And it's just a matter of like testing which ones they can climb. So let's uh, let's get the mangrove apple. We'll have to play for a little bit just to let it register and click on a lemur. Yes, see, they can also climb that one. So that's actually a really, I might leave this one in. It's a really pretty tree to be getting in here and it's short enough that it fits in our enclosure here as well. So you can use those as climbing things. And again, if we come back to here, we can see actually even with just those two trees, oh, and of course, all, <laughs> all of the wooden beams are counting as climbing space as well. 
they have got enough navigatable area that they're happy of course if there's more lemurs in here that's probably not going to be enough and they've got way more space than is needed but i'm going to fill this with a lot of detailing which is of course going to reduce that space so better more than not enough so ultimately what we do need to do now is really design the inside of this habitat and of course the detail all around it as well in these little open spaces here so we will go ahead and do that in another time lapse and then we'll be back to review what we've done
Okay, so honestly that took an awfully long time and there's quite a lot that you wouldn't have seen because I just couldn't fit it into the episode so all of this path detailing you wouldn't have seen but it's exactly the same principle as we did around the prairie dogs habitat so you know how to do that by now we just copied over the logs and filled it with some plants now coming on to the habitat I'm super pleased with how this has turned out now one key thing that I always wondered about when I first started playing planet zoo there aren't any tires so this african bead shape so you do need the African pack for that. You can colour it in fully black and that gives you essentially the effect of a tyre, which I really, really like there. And now the lemurs do climb on all of the ropes as well. So yeah, it's, it's super fun to watch them bounding around. For the basis of this climbing frame, I actually took one of the blueprints, as you would have seen. I ended up moving it out of the cage because it was a bit silly to try and work in here because the views is really restricted indoors. So I moved it out, built the climbing frame as I wanted it and then moved it back in and really pleased with how it's come out with the feeding platform down at the bottom here we also then come in and we've got a little bit more of a green area down this side with the sprinkler hidden there i actually used a rock to cover up the bottom of it which i feel like looks a little bit nicer and then lots of plants in the middle because we need to maintain access for the keeper to get around to the feeding platform which was something that i did have a few little issues with while i was recording this so I had to move several things so keeping the plants underneath the climbing frame the animals don't mind it at all doesn't bother them and it keeps the path clear for the keeper and then just coming on to the corridor now the key thing with this like, I really wanted the lemurs to be running along this wooden pole in front of where the guests stand here in fact there's no one why is no one standing here they're all around there <laughs> So I really wanted this right in front of the window, but you have to make sure that you don't have it too close to the barrier because there is a little bit of a glitch with animals where if you put climbing apparatus too close to the barrier, they can sometimes kind of fly somehow glitch through the barrier and escape pretty easily. So I've made a similar model to this before where the lemurs are constantly escaping. <laughs> so make sure that you're leaving a decent gap there if you want to follow that. But it's super cool to watch because, yeah, you can just see them running along all of this apparatus right in front of your eyes. And yeah, really like that. Then we come on to the little back area. So we do have the water pipe back here hidden away. And then it's kind of like a little holding area, really, where they can sleep. And it's just very concrete, very plain. Nothing too much in there. And then coming onto the little front cage again we've got some climbing frames back here to help them access into this area so they can climb through these circular plaster wall pieces which is why i just absolutely love these and then again we've got a little sprinkler hidden by a rock and just a few little bits of climbing apparatus so i've used the bridges here supported by some of the climbing log poles uh put in lots of the enrichment items as well because we have now reached level five because it took me so <laughs> so long on the research so we've got all the enrichment items so they're fully fledged with like feeders and toys and things like that so i put them all over the habitat to try and make sure that we're getting lemurs in all areas even though there are absolutely none out here right now then with the education boards i actually just put in a couple and used x to rotate them so they kind of sit up against the bottom of the habitat so they're not blocking views there but the guests are still getting their education um, and then yeah we of course we've got the big sign but that really was it we've hidden away the staff area back here and as mentioned we did hide the electricity transformer actually at the back and this is still accessible so you can put a wall right over it can we get inside to see yeah you see it looks like it's just being completely blocked but it's still completely accessible there and it's it, I, I think it actually looks quite nice it's a nice little bit of detailing but yeah that was it from that part and then the only other thing that you wouldn't have seen is i have added in a little information booth over here using exactly the same building style as we used on the entrance to keep it nice and consistent little toilets in the back here which i did just offset slightly by two meters to give it a little bit more interest and then actually change the color of the toilets to make it quite dark a little bit of flooring some breeze box poles there just to decorate it up and of course vents across the back but i think that sits in quite nicely on that corner so it's all looking pretty good when we come down the path now and we come up towards the massive lemur house cage <laughs> yeah i'm really pleased with how this has turned out and there's multiple walking routes of course we've got the main path kept really nice and clear there uh, so we shouldn't have any problems with sims blocking paths and everything's really quite wide and spacious so that's what you want to do is leave lots of space and then you can fill it with plants and rocks and other kind of detailing and it really works really nicely so in the next episode, we will start off by talking about staff work zones and a little bit about staff management. And then we'll come on, of course, to do another habitat, which I'm super excited to get onto. 
please do let me know your name suggestions for all of these lemurs in the comments because we've already had babies <laughs> so we've got loads of them please let me know your name suggestions for those and we will get them yeah all named up at the start of the next episode and if you are wanting to pick up planet zoo or any of the dlcs please do use my instant gaming link which is linked in the description below it helps to support the channel and there are some seriously big discounts available from it but that is going to be all from me for today so if you have enjoyed the video likes comments and shares are as always super super appreciated i'm really having fun doing this planet zoo series it's something a little bit different for my channel uh, but I'm really enjoying it. It's a game I really love and all the little details in it make it very, very satisfying indeed. But that's all from me for today. So thank you so much for tuning in and I'll catch you again next time. Bye bye.